Summer Resources by Fanny Hurst. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Summer Resources by Fanny Hurst. At seven o'clock, the Seaside Hotel struggled into full dress. Ladies emerged from siestas and curl papers. Dowagers wormed into straight fronts and spread the spousal vestments of boiled shirt, U-shaped waistcoat, at all across the bed. Slim young men in the swelter of their inside two fifty a day rooms carefully extracted their braided at the seams trousers from beneath the mattresses and removed trees from patent leather pumps. At seven thirty, young girls fluttered in and out from the dining room like brilliant night moths. The straight front dowagers, U-vested spouses, and slim young men in braided trouser seams crowded about the desk for the influx of mail, and read their tailor and modiste duns with the rapt and misleading expression that suggested a love rune rather than a please remit. Interested mothers elbowed for the most desirable veranda rockers, the blather of voices, the imp ump ump of the three nights a week orchestra and the remote pound of the ocean joined in united effort at eight o'clock miss myra sternberger yawned in her wicker rocker and raised two round and bare to the elbow arms high above her head gee she said this place is so slow it gets on my nerves it does mrs blondheim who carried toast away from the breakfast table concealed beneath a napkin for her daughter who remained abed until noon, paused in her Irish crochet, spread a lace wheel upon her ample knee, and regarded it approvingly. "'What you got to kick about, Miss Sternberger? Didn't I see you in the surf this morning with that shirtwaist drummer from Cincinnati?' "'Mr. Eckstein. Oh, I've been meeting him down here in July for two years. He's a nice fellow and makes a good living, but he ain't my style.' Girls are too particular nowadays. Take my Bella. Why, that girl's had chances you wouldn't believe. But she always says to me, she says, Mama, I ain't gonna marry till Mr. Wright comes along. That's just the same way with me. My Bella had chances. Not one, but six. You can ask anybody who knows us in New York the chances that Goyle has had. I ain't in a hurry to take the first man that asked me, neither. Mrs. Blondheim wrapped the forefinger of her left hand with the mercerized cotton thread, and her needle flashed deftly. What about the little Baltimore fellow that went away yesterday? I seen he was keeping you pretty busy. Ah, oh, Mrs. Blondheim, can't a girl have a good time with a fellow without getting serious? But she giggled in pleased self-consciousness and pushed her combs into place. Miss Sternberger wore her hair oval about her face like Mona Lisa. Her cheeks were pink-tinted, like the lining of a cock shell. My Bella always says a goyle can't be too careful at these here summer resorts. That's why she ain't out every night like some of these goyles. She won't go out with a young man till she knows he comes from nice people. Miss Sternberger patted the back of her hand against her mouth and stifled a yawn. One thing I must say for my Bella, no matter where I take that goyle, everybody says what a nice retiring goyle she is. Bella does retire rather early, agreed Miss Sternberger, in tones drippingly sweet. I try to make her rest up in summer, pursued Mrs. Blondheim, unpunctured. You goyles wear yourselves out. Nothing but bows, bows, all the time. There ain't a night in New York that my Bella ain't out with some young man. I always say to her, Bella, the theaters ought to give you a commission. Miss Sternberger rocked. Where did you say you live in New York, Miss Sternberger? West 111th Street. Oh, yes. Are you related to the Morris Sternbergers in the boys' pants business? I think, on my father's side. Honest now, Carrie Sternberger. Sternberger married my brother-in-law, and they're doing grand, too. He's built up a fine business there. 
ain't this a small world after all it is that agreed miss sternberger why last summer i was eating three meals a day next to my first cousin and didn't know it look said mrs blontine there's those made-up rosenstein goyles coming out of the dining room look at the agony they put on would you i know em when they were living over their hair store on twenty thoid street i wonder where my bella is that's a stylish messaline the second one's got on all right i think them beaded tunics are swell if it hadn't been for the false hair craze old man rosenstein wouldn't mrs blondheim leaned forward in her chair her little flowered silk work bag dropped to the floor there's bella now honest that mr arnheim's ain't left her once to-day and he only got here this morning too such a fine young man the clerk says he's been abroad six months and just landed yesterday and been with her all day when i think of the chances that goyle had why marcus finbeck who was down here last week was crazy about her did you say that fellow's name was arnheim yes ain't you heard of the arnheim models he's a grand boy the clerk says and the swellest importer of ladies wear in new york miss sternberger leaned forward in her chair is that simon arnheim sure he's the one that introduced the hobbleskoit my bella was one of the first to wear one there ain't a fad that he don't go over to europe and get he made a fortune off the hobbleskoit alone is that so believe me if he wasn't all right my bella wouldn't let him hang on her that way i've heard of him i wish you could see that babette dreyfus i and my bella she's just green because bella's got him do you use the double stitch in your crochet mrs blondheim that's a pretty pattern you're working on yes i just finished a set of doilies you'd pay twenty-five dollars for anywhere miss sternberger rose languidly to her feet well she said i guess i'll take a stroll and go up to bed don't be so fidgety miss sternberger sit down by me and talk miss sternberger smiled i'll see you later miss blondheim and don't forget that preparation i was telling you about sloan's mosquito skip just rub the bottle stopper over your pillow and see if it'll work she moved away with the dignity of an emperor moth slim and supple hipped in a tight wrapped gown the seaside hotel lobby leaned forward in its chairs young men moved their feet from the veranda rail and gazed after her pleasantries fell in her pathway as roses before a queen a splay-mouthed youth his face and neck sunburnt to a beefy red tugged at her gold-colored scarf as she passed oh you myra he sang quit you kiddin izzy she parried back who was that blonde i seen you with down at the beach this morning a voluptuous brunette in a rose-pink dress and diamonds dragged her down to the arm of her rocker i got a trade less for you myra for me yes give it to me clara no i said a trade and a dandy too who from man yes well i got one for you too leon eckstein says he thinks you're an awfully sweet girl and will make some man a grand wife Clara giggled and fingered the gold fringe edging of Miss Sternberger's sleeve. She spoke slowly and stressed each word alike. Well, there's a fellow just got here from Paris yesterday. Says you sure know how to dress and that you got a swell figure. Who said it? Yes. I should know. That fellow over there with Bella Blondheim the one with the smooth face and grayish hair. I hear he's a swell New York fella in the important business. How Bella grab him? She's been holding on to him like a crawfish all day. She won't let anybody get near him. Neither will her mother. Here comes Izzy over here after me. If there's one fellow I can't stand, it's him. Miss Sternberger moved away with her chin tilted at a sharp angle. At a turn in the veranda, she came suddenly upon Miss Bella Blondheim and a sleek, well-dressed young man with grayish hair. Miss Blondheim's hand was hooked with a deadlock clutch to the arm of her companion. 
Miss Sternberger threw herself before them like a melodrama queen flagging a train. Hello, Bella, she said in a voice as low as a cello. Miss Blondheim, who had once sold the greatest number of aprons at a charity bazaar, turned cold eyes upon the intruder. Hello, Myra, she said in cool tones of dismissal. There was a pause. The color swept up and surged over Miss Blondheim's face. Are you finished with Love in a Cottage, Bella? I promised it to Mrs. Weiss when you were finished with it. Yes, said Bella. I'll bring it down tonight. There was another pause. The young man with the grayish hair coughed. Mr. Arnheim, let me introduce you to my friend, Miss Sternberger. Miss Sternberger extended a highly groomed hand. Pleased to meet you, she said. How do you do? Miss Sternberger, his arm squirmed free from the deadlock clutch. Won't you join us? Thanks, said Myra, smiling until an amazing quantity of small white teeth showed. But I just stopped by to tell Bella that Mrs. Blondheim was asking for her. There was a third pause. Won't you come along, Mr. Arnheim? Mama's always so worried about me, and I'd like for you to meet Mama, said Bella anxiously. With a heroic jerk, Mr. Arnheim managed to free himself entirely. Thanks, he said, but I think I'll stay out and have a smoke. Miss Blondheim's lips dropped at the corners. She entered the bright, gabbling lobby, threading her way to her mother's stronghold. The maternal glance that greeted her was cold and withering. I knew if I couldn't hold her, she'd get him away. That's why I didn't go and play lotto with the ladies. Well, I couldn't help it, could I? You're always nosing after me so. Anybody could say you want me and not be lying. That's the thanks I get for trying to do the right thing by my children. When I was your age, I had more gumption in my little finger than you got in your whole hand. I'd like to see a little piece like her get ahead of me. No wonder you ain't got no luck. Miss Blondheim sat down wearily beside her mother. I wish I knew how she does it. Knife, that's how. Ain't I been preaching knife to you ever since you could talk? You'd be married to Marcus Finberg now if you'd a worked it right and listened to your mother. Ah, oh, ma, let me alone. I couldn't make him pop, could I? I don't see other girls' mothers always button in. Out in the cool of the veranda, Miss Sternberger strolled over to the railing and leaned her back against a white wooden column. Her eyes, upslanting and full of languor, looked out over the toiling, moiling ocean. She was outlined as gently as a Rembrandt. A penny for your thoughts, Miss Sternberger? Mr. Arnheim, the glowing end of a newly lighted cigar in one corner of his mouth, peered his head over her shoulder. Oh, Mr. Arnheim, how you scared me. Miss Sternberger placed the well-groomed left hand with a seal ring on the third finger upon the thread-lace bosom of her gown. How you frighten me. It's a nice night, Miss Sternberger. Want to walk on the beach? Don't mind if I do, she said. They strolled the length of the veranda, down the steps to the boardwalk and the beach beyond. Mrs. Blondheim rolled her crochet into a tight ball and stuck her needle upright. Come on, Bella, let's go to bed. They trailed past the desk, like birds with damp feathers. Send up some ice water to 318, said Miss Bella, over the counter, her eyes straining, meanwhile, past the veranda to the beach below, without... A moon low and heavy and red came out from the horizon. It cast a copper-gold band across the water. Let's go down to the edge, kiddo. Mr. Arnheim helped Miss Sternberger plow daintily through the sand. If I get sand in my shoes, I'll blame you, Mr. Arnheim. Little slippers like yours can't hold much, she giggled. They seated themselves like small dunes on the white expanse of beach. He drew his knees up under his chin and nursed them. In the eerie light, they might have been a fay and a fawn in evening dress. Well, said Mr. Arnheim, exhaling loudly, 
this is something like it. Ain't it a grand moon, though, Mr. Arnheim? The moon ain't got a show when you're around, little one. I'll bet you say that to every girl you meet. Yes, I do, but I know when a girl looks good to me. I wish I knew if you was jollying me or not. He tossed the cigar into the surf that curled at their very feet, leaving a rim of foam and scum. The red end died with a fizz. Then he turned his dark eyes full upon her, with a steady focus. If you knew me better, you'd know that I ain't that sort of a fellow. When I say a thing, I mean it. His hand lay outstretched. She poured rivulets of white sand between the fingers. They watched the little mounds of sand which she patted into shape. I'll bet you're a New York girl. Why? I can tell them every time, style and all. I'll bet you're a New York fellow, too. Little New York is good enough for me. I've been over in Paris four months now, and believe me, it looked good yesterday to see the old girlie holding a lamp over the harbor. Miss Sternberger ran her hand over the smooth sheen of her dress. Her gown was chaste, even stern, in its simplicity, the expensive simplicity that is artful rather than artless. That's a neat little model you're wearing. Ah, oh, Miss Arnheim, what do you know about clothes? Miss Arnheim threw back his head and laughed long and loud. What do I know about clothes? I only been in the biz for eight years. What I don't know about ladies wear ain't in the dictionary. Well, said Miss Sternberger, that's so. I did hear you was in the business. I'm in the important line, I am. Why, girl, I put through every fad that's taken hold in the last five years. Brought them over myself, too. I've dressed Broadway and Fifth Avenue and everything from rainy day to harem skirts. Honest? Sure. I've imported more good sellers than any dealer in New York. I got a new model now passing customs that's to be a bigger hit than the sheath was. Say, when I brought over the hobble, every house on the avenue laughed in my face, and when I finally dumped a consignment onto one of them, the firm was scared stiff and wanted to countermand, but I had em, and they couldn't jump me. Just think! By Jove, it wasn't two weeks before that very model was the talk of New York, and Lillian Russell was wearing one in the second act of her show, and when she wears a model, it's as good as made. Gee, she said, I could just sit and listen to you talk and talk. He hunched close. I sold the first dozen pannier dresses for a sum that would give you the blind staggers. I was just as scared as she was, too, but all you gotta do with women is to get a few good-looking bell sheep to lead, and the others will follow fast. She regarded him in the wan moonlight. If there's anything I admire, she said, it's a smart man. Oh, I don't know, he said. I've just got a little better judgment than the next fellow. Those things come natural, that's all. In my line, a fellow's got to know human nature. If I'd sprung the hobble on the avenue five years ago, I'd gone broke on the gamble, but I sprung the idea on him at just the right time. Her hand, long and slim, lay like a bit of carved ivory on the sand. He leaned forward and covered it with his. I want to see a great deal of you while I'm down here. She did not reply, but drew her hand away with a shy diffidence. I'll bet I could show you some things that would warm you up all right. I'm going into New York the swellest bunch of French novelties you ever seen. I've got a peach-colored piquet model I brought over that's going to be the talk of the town. A piquet? He laughed delightedly. Sure, you never heard of the firm? Wait till you see him on show at the opening. It's got the new butterfly back, and believe me, it wasn't no cinch to grab that pattern, neither. I laid low in Paris two months before I even got a smell at it. You talk just like a story book, she said. He stretched himself full length on the sand and looked up into her face. I'll show you a thing or two when we get back to New York, little one. You ain't like most of the boys I know, Mr. Arnheim. 
You got something different about you. And you got a face like the kind you see painted on fans. On the order of a Japanese dame. I got some swell Japanese imports, too. Everybody says that about me. I take after Pa. Say, little one, I want your telephone number when I get back to New York. I'll be pleased to have you call me up, Mr. Arnheim. Will I call you up? Well, rather. I know some nice girls I'll introduce you to. He looked at her insinuatingly. I know one nice girl, and that's enough, he said. Oh, Mr. Arnheim, of all the jolliers I ever knew, you got em beat. She rose to her feet, like a gold-colored phoenix from a mound of white sand. When I meet a fellow I like, I don't want him to tell me nothing but the truth. That's just the way with me. When I meet a girl that looks good, I want to treat her white, and I want her to do the same by me. They strolled along the edge of the beach. Once the foaming surf threatened to lap over her slippers, he caught her deftly and raised her high above the swirl. Oh, she cried a little breathlessly, ain't you strong? Then she laughed in a high-pitched voice. They dallied until the moon hardened from a soft low ball to a high yellow disk, and the night damp seeped into their clothes. Miss Sternberger's yellow scarf lay like a limp rag on her shoulders. You're a perfect thirty-six, ain't you, little one? That's what they say when I try on ready-mates, she replied with sweet reticence. Gee, he said. Wouldn't I like you and some of my models? Maybe if you ain't no snitch, I'll show you the colored plate some day. I ain't no snitch, she said. Her voice was like a faraway echo. They climbed the wooden steps to their hotel like glorified children who had been caught in a silver weft of enchantment. The lobby was semi-dark. They asked for their keys in whispers and exchanged good nights in long-drawn undertones. Until... Tomorrow, little one. Until tomorrow. She entered the elevator with a smile on her lips and in her eyes. They regarded each other through the iron framework until she shot from sight. At breakfast next morning, Mrs. Blondheim drew up before her small steak, French fried potatoes, jelly omelet, buttered toast, buckwheat cakes, and coffee. Well, of all the night she exclaimed to her vis-a-vis -vis mrs epstein if there ain't myra sternberger eatin breakfast with that mr arnheim mrs epstein opened a steaming muffin inserted a lump of butter and pressed the halves together i said to my husband last night she remarked i'm glad we ain't got no daughters till they're married off and all it ain't no fun with my louie now it's different when he came out of the business school my husband put him in business and now i ain't got no worry my bella ain't never given me a day's worry neither and i ain't in no hurry to marry her off she always says to me mamma she says i ain't in no hurry to marry till mr wright comes along my louie is coming down today or tomorrow on his vacation if he can get away from business louie's a good boy if i do say so myself i don't want to talk but I often say what my Bella gets when she marries is enough to give any young man a fine start in a good business. I must have my Louie meet Miss Bella. The notes and letters Louie gets from girls you wouldn't believe. He don't pay no attention to em. He's an awful mama boy, Mrs. Blondheim. It will be grand for them to meet, said Mrs. Blondheim. If I do say it, my Bella's had proposals you wouldn't believe. Look at Simon Arnheim over there. He only met her yesterday, and do you think he would leave her side all day? No siree. Honest, it makes me mad sometimes. A grand young man comes along and Bella introduces him to everyone, but she won't have nothing to do with him. Try some of this liver and onions, Mrs. Blondheim. It's delicious. Mrs. Blondheim partook and nibbled between her front teeth. I got a grand recipe for sus and sour liver. When we're at home, my Bella always says, Mama, let's have some liver and gedampfless flesh for lunch. Do you soak your liver first? inquired Mrs. Epstein, 
my louie won't eat nothing sus and sour it makes me so mad i got to cook different for every one in my family louie won't eat this and his father won't eat that i'll give you the recipe when i give you the one for the noodles bella says it's the best she ever ate my husband gets so mad when i go down in the kitchen me with two grand girls and a washerwoman two days a week but the girls can't cook to suit me excuse me too from american cooking mrs blondheim's interest and gaze wandered down the dining hall i wish you'd look at that steinberger girl acting up ain't it disgusting please pass the salt mrs blondheim that's the trouble with hotel cooking they don't season at home we like plenty of it too i season and season and then at the table my husband has to have more she wouldn't have met him at all if it hadn't have been for bella pursued mrs blondheim the object of mrs blondheim's solicitude fresh as spring in crisp white linen turned her long eyes upon mr arnheim you ought to feel flattered mr arnheim that i let you come over to my table mr arnheim regarded her through a mist of fragrant coffee steam you bet your life i feel flattered i'd get up earlier than this to have breakfast with a little queen ain't you ever going to quit jollying he leaned across the table that ain't a bad linen model you're wearing it's domestic goods too where'd you get it at lipman's i sold them a consignment last year but say if you want to see real classy white goods you ought to see some routine cutaways i'm bringing over i've brought a model i'm going to call the phoebe snow it's the niftiest thing for early fall you ever saw routine you never heard of it that's where i get my work in it's the new lines the novelty stuff that gets the money are you going in the surf this morning mr arnheim i'm going where you go little one he dropped two lumps of sugar into her coffee cup sweets to the sweet he said silly but she giggled under her breath they pushed back their chairs and strolled down the aisle between the tables she smiled brightly to her right and left good morning miss blondheim is it warm enough for you good morning replied miss blondheim stabbing a bit of omelet with vindictive fork mr epstein looked after the pair with warming eyes she is a stylish dresser ain't she i wish you'd seen the white linen my bella's got it's got sixteen yards of cloony lace in the waist alone and such cloony too i paid a dollar and a half a yard wholesale just look at this waist i'm wearing mrs blondheim you wouldn't think i paid three and a half for the lace would you oh yes i can always tell good stuff when i see it and i always say it pays best in the end said mrs blondheim feeling the heavy lace edge of mrs epstein's sleeve between discriminating thumb and forefinger suddenly mrs epstein's eyes widened she rose to her feet drawing a corner of the tablecloth awry if it ain't my louie mr louis epstein a faithful replica of his mother with close black hair that curled on his head like the nap of the persian lamb imprinted a large moist kiss upon the maternal lips hello ma didn't you expect me not till the ten o'clock train louie how's papa he's fine i left him billin thumb goods to bookang how's business louie not though bad but pa can't get away yet for a week the fall goods ain't all out yet ain't it awful the way that man is all for business mrs blondheim this is my son louie well well mr epstein i've heard a lot about you i want you to meet my daughter bella you ought to make friends get them said mr epstein out on the clean washed beach the sun glinted on the water and sent points of light dancing on the wavelets like bits of glass children in blue rompers burrowed and jangled their painted spades and pails nursemaids planted umbrellas in the sand and watched their charges romp parasols flashed past like gay-colored meteors in the white-capped surf 
Bathers bobbed and shouted, and all along the shoreline the tide ran gently up the beach and down again, leaving a smooth, damp stretch of sand which sold and sucked beneath the steps of the bathers. Far out, where the waters were highest and the white caps maddest, Mr. Einheim held Miss Sternberger about her slim waist and raised her high over each rushing breaker. They caught the swells and lay back against the heavy toe, letting the wavelets lap up to their chins. Mr. Arnheim, with little rivulets running down his cheeks, shook the water out of his grayish hair and looked at her with salt-bitten, red-rimmed eyes. Gee, he wheezed, you're a spunky little devil. Excuse me from the beach walkers. I like em when they're game like you. She danced about like an amphitrite. Who would be afraid of the water with a dandy swimmer like you? This ain't nothing, said Mr. Arnheim. You ought to see me in Stillwater. At our van last summer, I was the talk of the place. They emerged from the water, dripping and heavy-footed. She wrung out her brief little skirts and stamped her feet on the sand. Mr. Arnheim hopped on one foot and then on the other, holding his head aslant. Then they stretched out on the white, sun-baked beach. Miss Sternberger loosened her hair, and it showered about her. Gee, ain't you got a swell bunch of hair? She shook and fluffed it. You ought to seen it before I had typhoid. I could sit on it then. That Phoebe Snow model that I got in mind for Lillian Russell would make you look like a queen with that hair of yon. She buried his arm in the sand and patted the mound. Now, she said, I got you, and you can't do anything without asking me. You got me anyway, he said with an expressive glance. Yes, she purred, that's what you say now. But when you get back to New York, you'll forget all about the little girl you met down at the shore. That's all you know about me. I don't take up with every girl. I'm glad you don't. But I'll bet you got a different fellow for every day when you're in New York. Nothing like that, she said. But anyway, there's always room for one more. Two young men without hats passed. Miss Sternberger called out her greeting. Hello, Manny. Wasn't the water grand? What? Well, you tell Leo he don't know nothing. No, we don't want to have our pictures taken. Mr. Arnheim, I want to introduce you to Mr. Landauer, a neckwear man out of Baltimore, and Mr. Manny Sinai, also neckwear, out of New York. They posed, with the white sunlight in their eyes. I hope we won't break the camera, said Arnheim. The remark was greeted with laughter. The little machine clicked. The newcomers departed, and then Miss Sternberger and Mr. Arnheim turned to each other again. You ain't tired, are you, Myra? No, Simon. She danced to her feet and tossed the hair back from her face. I ain't tired. They walked down the beach toward the bathhouse, humming softly to themselves. I'll be out in ten minutes, she said, pausing at the door of her locker. Me too. When they met again, they were regroomed and full of verve. She was as cool as a rose. They laughed at their crinkly fingertips, wrinkled by the water like parchment, and his neck, where it rose above the soft high collar, was branded by the sun a flaming red. Gee, she cried, ain't you sunburnt? I always tan red, he said. And me, I always tan, tan. They exchanged these pithy and inspired bits of autobiography in warm, intimate tones. At their hotel steps, she sighed with a delicious weariness. I wish I could do everything for you, little one, even walk upstairs. I ain't tired, Simon. Only, only, oh, I don't know. Little one, he said softly. In the lobby, Miss Bella Blondheim leaned an elbow on the clerk's desk and talked to a stout young man with a gold-mounted elk's tooth on his watch-fob and black hair that curled close to his head. They made a group of four for a moment, Miss Blondheim regarding the arrivals with bright, triumphant eyes. "'My friend, Mr. Louis Epstein,' she said. The men shook hands. 
related to the Epstein and Son Millinery Company, Broadway and Spring? Certainly am. I happen to be the thun myself. Was you in the surf this morning, Bella? It was grand. No, Myra, replied her friend. Mr. Epstein and me took a trip to Ocean View. You missed the water this morning. It was fine and dandy, volunteered Mr. Arnheim. Me and Mr. Epstein are going this afternoon, ain't we? We certainly are, agreed Mr. Epstein, regarding Miss Blondheim with small, admiring eyes. Miss Sternberger edged away. Pleased to have met you, Mr. Epstein. Mr. Arnheim edged with her, and they moved on their way toward the dining room. Mrs. Blondheim, from her point of vantage, the wicker rocker, leaned toward her sister-in-law. Look, Hannah, that's Louis Epstein, of the Epstein and Son Millinery Company, with Bella. He's a grand boy. I meet his mother at Dr. Bergenthal's lecture every Saturday morning. Epstein and Son. I've got a grand business, and Bella could do a whole lot worse. Well, I wish her luck, said Mrs. Blondheim's sister-in-law. I smell fright smelts. Let's go in to lunch. Mrs. Blondheim stabbed her crochet needle into her spool. I usually dip my smelts in bread crumb. Have you ever tried them that way, Hannah? Julius doesn't eat smelts. They moved toward the dining room. Late that afternoon, Miss Sternberger and Mr. Arnheim returned from a sale. Their faces were flushed and full of shy, sweet mystery. I can't show you the models the way I'd like to, dearie, but I got them in colors just like the real thing. Oh, Simon, you're doing a thing like this for me without me even asking you. His hold of her arm tightened. I wouldn't show these here to my own sister before the 25th of the month. Now you know how you stand with me, little one. Oh, she cried, I'm so excited. It's just like looking behind the scenes in a theater. He left her and returned a few moments later with a flat, red-covered portfolio. They sought out an unmolested spot and snuggled in a corner of a plush divan in one of the deserted parlors. He drew back the cover, and their heads bent low. At each turn of the pages she breathed her ecstasy and gave out shrills and calls of admiration. "'Oh, Simon, ain't that pink one a beauty? Ain't that skirt the swellest thing you ever seen?' That's the piquet model, girlie. You and all New York will be buying it in another month. Ain't it the selectest little thing ever? Her face was rapt. It's the swellest thing I've ever seen, she declared. He turned to another plate. Oh, she cried. Ain't that a beauty? That there is going to be the biggest hit I've had yet. Watch out for the Phoebe Snow. I've got the original model in my trunks. That cutaway effect can't be beat. Oh, she repeated. They passed slowly over the gay-colored plates. There's that flame-colored one I'd like to see you in. Gee, she said, there's some class to that. After a while, the book was laid aside, and they talked in low, serious tones. Occasionally, his hand stroked hers. The afternoon waned. The lobby thinned. The dowagers and their daughters asked for room keys and disappeared for siestas and more mysterious processes. Children trailed off to rest. The hot land breezes, dry and listless, stirred the lace curtains of the parlor. But they remained on the plush divan, wrapped as might have been Paolo and Francesca in their romance in Butte Harbor. How long will you be down here? she asked. As long as you, he replied, not taking his eyes from her face. Honest? Sure. I don't have to go into New York for a week or ten days yet. My season ain't on yet. She leaned her head against the back of the divan. All things must end, she said, with the cello note in her voice. Oh, I don't know, he replied, with what might have been triple significance. They finally walked toward the elevator loath to part for the interim of dressing. That evening they strolled together on the beach until the last lights of the hotel were blinking out. Then they stole into the semi-dark lobby like thieves, but soft voice, joyous thieves. A few straggling couples like themselves came in with the same sheepish, 
but bright-eyed hesitancy. At the elevator, Miss Blondheim and Mr. Epstein were lingering over good nights. The quartet rode to their respective floors together, the girls regarding each other with shy, happy eyes, the men covering up their self-consciousness with sounds. "'Ain't you ashamed to keep such late hours, Miss Blondheim?' said Mr. Arnheim. "'I don't see no early-to-bed, early-to-rise medals on none of us,' she said, diffidently. "'The thummer were thort. Sure ain't got no place for a minute or thun, said Mr. Epstein. Laughter. Remember, Mr. Arnheim, whoever's up first, wait in the leather chair opposite the elevator. Sure thing, Miss Sternberger. Her last glance, full of significance, was for Mr. Arnheim. The floor above, he also left the elevator, the smile still on his lips. Left alone, Mr. Epstein turned to Miss Blonheim. Good night, dearie. Sweet dreams. Good night, Louie, she replied. Same to you. Mr. Arnheim awoke to a scudding rain, his ocean ward window sill dripping and a great patch of carpet beneath the window, dark and soggy. Downstairs, the lobby buzzed with restrained energies, a few venturesome ones in oils, in turned-up collars, paced the veranda without. Mr. Arnheim, in his invariable soft collar and shadow-checked suit, skirted the edge of the crowd in matinal ill-humor, and deposited his room key at the desk. The clerk gave him in return a folded newspaper and his morning mail. Mr. Arnheim's morning aspect was undeniable. He suggested too generous use of soap and bay rum, and his eyes had not lost the swollen heaviness that comes with too much or too little sleep. He yawned and seated himself in the heavy leather chair opposite the elevator. His first letter was unstamped and addressed to him on hotel stationery. The handwriting was an unfamiliar backhand, and the enclosure brief. Dear Mr. Arnheim, I am very sorry we could not keep out date, but I got a message, and I got to go in on the 710 train. Hope to see you when I come back. Sincerely, Myra Sternberger. Mr. Arnheim replaced the letter slowly in the envelope. There were two remaining, a communication from a cloak manufacturing firm and a check from a banking house. He read them and placed them in his inside coat pocket. Then he settled the back of his neck against the rim of the chair, crossed one leg over the other, rattled his newspaper open, and turned to the stock market reports. One week later, Mr. Simon Arnheim, a red portfolio under one arm, walked into the mahogany, green-carpeted, soft-lighted establishment of an importing house on Fifth Avenue. Mrs. S. S. Schlimberg, senior member, greeted him in her third-floor office behind the fitting rooms. "'Well, well, we begets, Arnheim. I thought it was getting time for you.' Mr. Arnheim shook hands and settled himself in a chair beside the desk. "'You know you can always depend on me, madam, to look you up the minute I get back. Don't I always give you first choice?' Mrs. Schlemberg weighed a crystal paperweight up and down in her pudgy, ringed hands. "'None of your fancy prices for me this season, Arnheim. There's too many good things lying loose. That's why I got my opening a month sooner. I got a design that came in special off a vacation with some good things.' Mr. Arnheim winked. "'Schlem, I got some models here to show you that you can't beat. When you see em, you'll pay any price.' I can't pay you fancy prices no more. I paid you too much for that plush fad last winter, and it never was a go. Mr. Arnheim chuckled. When you see a couple of the designs I brought over this trip, you'll be willing to pay me twice as much as for the hobble. Come on, own up, Schlem. You can't beat my styles. Why, you can copy them for your import room and make ninety per cent on any one of them. They won't pay the prices, I tell you. Some of my best customers have gone over to other houses for the cheaper goods. You can't put over domestic stuff on your trade, Schlem. You might as well admit it. You gotta sting your class of trade in order to have them appreciate you. Now, just to show you that I know what I'm talking about, Arnheim, I got the best lines of new models for this season I've had since I'm in business. 
every one of them domestics too i'm putting some made in america models in the import room today that will open your eyes mr arnheim laughed and opened his portfolio i'll show you these till my trunks come up he said just a minute arnheim i want to show you some stuff miss sternberger mrs schlimberg raised her voice slightly miss sternberger almost immediately a svelte black gowned figure appeared in the doorway she wore her hair oval about her face like a mona lisa and her hands were long in the dusky white of ivory mr arnheim i want to introduce you to a designer we've got since you went away mr arnheim miss sternberger the whir of sewing machines from the workrooms cut the silence how do you do said miss sternberger how do you do said mr arnheim miss sternberger is like you mr arnheim she's always out after novelties and i will say for her she don't miss out she put out a line of uncut velvets last winter that was the best sellers we had mr arnheim bowed miss schlimberg turned to miss sternberger miss sternberger will you bring in some of those new models that are going like hot cakes just some of the forms will do certainly she disappeared from the doorway miss schlimberg tapped her forefinger on the desk there's the finest little designer we've ever had i got her off a of philadelphia house and i ain't never regretted the money i'm paying her she's done more for the house in eight months than miss isaacs did in ten years miss sternberger returned a stock boy wheeled in the new models on wooden figures while mrs schlimberg and her new designer arranged them for display mrs schlimberg turned to mr arnheim how's the wife and boys arnheim i ain't seen em since you brought em all in to see the labor day parade from the store windows last fall them's fine boys you got there arnheim thanks said arnheim now arnheim i'm here to ask you if you can't beat these look at that there peach bloom piquette look can you beat it that there's the new butterfly skirt just one year ahead of anything that's being shown this season mrs schlemberg turned to a second model look at this here ratine cutaway if the phoebe snow ain't the talk of new york before next week then i don't know my own name ain't it so miss sternberger miss sternberger ran her smooth hand over the lace shoulder of the gown this is a great seller she replied smiling at mr arnheim lillian russell is going to wear it in the second act of her new play when she opens tomorrow night i guess we're slow in here chuckled mrs schlemberg nudging mr arnheim with the point of her elbow miss sternberger spread the square train of a flame-colored robe full length on the green carpet and drew back a corner of the hem to display the lacy avalanche beneath then she bowed slightly and turned toward the door mrs schlemberg laid a detaining hand on her sleeve just a minute miss sternberger mr arnheim's brought in some models he wants us to look at End of Summer Resources by Fanny Hurst